Identity Server uses two types of data, configuration data and operational data. Operational data is temporary in nature and it contains things like authorization codes and refresh tokens. Both configuration and operational data was kept in memory during previous quick starts, but the goal of this one is to move it to a database so that it becomes persistent between restarts and it is usable across multiple identity server instances. I'm Roland Guit for Duende Software, the company behind Identity Server. In demos, Identity Server is often configured like this. Resources, scopes and clients are loaded from an in-memory location, such as the static classes used here. By default operational data is also kept in memory. We will move this data to a database. Before we do that, here are the links to the finished code and the written guide. Step 1 is to add the NuGet package Duende Identity Server Entity Framework. Since this already contains a reference to the Identity Server package, we can remove that to avoid future dependency issues. The package contains two Entity Framework DB contexts, one for configuration and one for operational data. Any Entity Framework database provider can be used. In this demo we are using SQLite, so the package for that has to be added too. And by the way, if you are not familiar with Entity Framework Core, I would recommend to study the basics before proceeding. Internally Identity Server uses store objects to work with data. The default stores use memory to store their data, but we want to deviate from the default by replacing the stores with the ones in the Entity Framework package we just added. To do that for the configuration data, while configuring Identity Server, add configuration store can be called, which is an extension method provided by the added package. The next step is to configure the DB context. For that we have to supply a name of the assembly where the migrations reside in. That's needed because by default Entity Framework will look for the migrations in the assembly where the DB contexts are. But in this case the migrations will be in the same assembly as where the class program is in, the startup assembly. We also need a connection string for the database provider we selected. Using this connection string in SQLite will simply create a file that acts as the database. Now that we have the needed information, the DB context configuration can be completed. The configuration data will now be loaded from the database, but the operational data will still be in memory. To use the database for that as well, add operational store can be used with the exact same configuration code. That is, if it's ok to put that in the same database. Note that you are not obligated to use both the configuration and operational database stores. You could for example choose to load the configuration data from a JSON configuration file and only persist operational data. We have set everything up, but the database file is still empty. No schema, no data. To create a schema, Initial migrations are needed that can be automatically generated from the DB contexts and applied to the database. For that the Entity Framework tools are needed, as well as an additional NuGet package. Before we add the migrations, there is an extra step. When the Entity Framework tool does its job, it will start the Identity Server assembly to read the database configuration. When it's done, it will throw an exception named host aborted exception. In program CS, we have to make sure this is not logged as a fatal error. Ok, we're ready to add the migrations. The name of the new migration has to be provided. And because we have multiple DB contexts, the name of the context has to be passed in as well. Persisted grant DB context represents the operational data of Identity Server and we want a migration generated in a specific location to keep things separate. Now the same can be done for the configuration DB context. In the project the migration files are now added. 
Now, when new versions of Identity Server come out, the contexts might change. And all you have to do then is to create another set of migrations and apply them to the database. To apply the migrations, you could run .NET EF database update from the command line. But for the demo, we're going to do it in code. In hosting extensions.cs, add a private method initialize database. Let's see what it does step by step. First, a server scope is created, so object instances can be safely retrieved from dependency injection. The persisted grant DB context is resolved and is instructed to migrate. And this means the migrations will be applied to the database. And the same for configuration DB context. And then a check if the clients table of the configuration DB context is empty. If it is, the clients are copied from the existing static class to the database. And the same is done for identity resources and API scopes. Now we have to call the new method somewhere. We do that in the configure pipeline method of hosting extensions.cs. Calling it every time the application starts is probably not ideal. At least not in production. So alternatively, you could also put the C data in the migration and execute the migrations in your build pipeline. Now when you run the identity server project, the database should contain the schema and the configuration data. A tool like SQLite Studio can be used to browse the schema and see the data. And that's it for this video. Hope it helps. See you in the next one.